Hi, I'm Kirk Jowers, and welcome to the March 17th episode of COVID-19 with Dr. Russell Osgathorpe. Russ, thank you for being with us again. My pleasure. We'll start with this graphic from the World Health Organization. There are now 184,976 confirmed cases, 7,529 deaths in 159 countries with cases. The first testing in humans of experimental vaccine has begun in the United States, but even if it has proved safe and effective, its potential availability is unknown. It'll take a while. We can talk about that later. Yeah, that's my first question to you. Iran confirmed its largest spike in cases in a 24-hour period. Europe is experiencing critical shortages of medical supplies, which is, extends now beyond northern Italy. Attorney General William Barr here in the United States is asking federal prosecutors to crack down on people spreading false claims and scams. 37 states in the U.S. have closed public schools. In California, 7 million residents and climbing have been ordered to shelter in place. Yeah, that was a big one. It's a big one. It goes to your social distancing you've mm -hmm. talked about a lot with us. Yep. Uh, today, stocks rebounded a bit mm -hmm. after yesterday's... Uh, excruciating 3,000 point loss. It finished up over 1,000 points for the day. And in, I guess, coordination with the economic issues, various proposals from the White House, Senate, many states yep. and municipalities are trying to get a handle on the economic consequences of this. Likewise, country by country, we could say the yeah, same thing. The economic consequences almost seem as scary sometimes as the actual cases. It does to me too. I've got friends in Italy that are talking about life there and industries going down and yeah. and of course small business probably have it more tough. Yeah, the than effects else. the effects of the economic downturn are going to be felt for a while. So let me get straight to the questions. What can you tell us about this new vaccine trial underway in Seattle? Well, there's not a lot out except that there is a, a an early phased trial of a vaccine that has been developed that looks to be tested in approximately 45 human subjects. Uh, there are other vaccines that are in similar stages of development and other countries are also working on, on vaccines. So everybody's trying to come up with a way to prevent this illness. This early phase is really just about immune response and safety and they're gonna work on efficacy in later larger studies, much, much larger studies before a vaccine is approved by the FDA in the United States for use, for example. So what can we learn from the 2009 pandemic? It certainly didn't reach these levels, but um, yeah, sure. what, what happened with those vaccines? So influenza is a little bit different than coronaviruses in that we have a huge industry set up to make vaccine for influenza every year for a worldwide epidemic of influenza right. that occurs every year. And in 2009's pandemic, we took advantage of that infrastructure. We're able to make a vaccine in relatively short order, get it tested, distributed quickly, uh, manufactured quickly, and a large majority of the developed world received the vaccine very, very quickly. Very quickly, can you quantify that from yeah, sure. start to so, finish? Uh, first cases in April of 2009, vaccine by October. Oh, wow. So it was really quick. But you think that's an ambitious projection for this one? I think so. I think that the same sort of uh, infrastructure and industry don't exist. We have a lot of technology. We've even come far in the last 10 years um, in terms of vaccine and manufacturing and development, but we still have to do all of the manufacturing distribution, and that's after the vaccine's been tested and found to be efficacious. So the director of NAAID, uh, Anthony Fauci, has said that it would be eight months in his mind before he saw a vaccine, and I think that's a decent estimate. Okay, we'll keep an eye on that. Second, the United States is way behind many other countries um, in, in our testing, although there are other countries that have done none to, to almost no testing. What yeah. does this lack of testing portend? Uh, the lack of testing is a real problem. For example, if you knew you had the virus, it would change how you would act for an average member of society. Right. You'd say, okay, I'm positive, I'm staying home, right? But if you didn't know you had the virus, and we've all heard that there are other viruses circulating, then maybe you just kind of say, well, I just think I'm, I have the cold, maybe I won't change the way I behave that much. And that's the problem. If we have widely available testing, we can isolate, quarantine, and respond differently, both as governments as well as individual members of society. So testing is really, really important. 
And it's going to be a while, I think, before, for example, in the United States, we have available testing that is widely, widely available. We're ramping up right now, right. but we're still far short of the tests that we need. And the final question, um, again, thank you everyone for your, your comments and for, for watching and contributing. Several people have asked, how should people take care of loved ones who have COVID-19 or have symptoms consistent with COVID-19? Although there are a few cases that are positive, relatively speaking, per the size of the population in the United States or around the world, for that matter, it's important to understand the answer to the question you just asked. Of if I'm asked to care for my husband or my child or my young adult who's living at home with this virus, what do I do? I think the best advice I'd give is the Centers for Disease Control on their website has a whole section of COVID-19 um, response dedicated to this exact thing. Okay. And the highlights of that are um, if you are a caregiver for somebody with COVID-19 or with symptoms consistent with COVID-19, that person ideally, the person with symptoms, will be isolated to a room in your home that if it's available, if your home has this available, they would be in a separate room behind a closed door with its own bathroom. Yeah. And if that can be the case, then that socially distances you from the people within your own home. If you are going into that room to deliver food or to take out laundry or to clean, do so with rigorous hand washing and where possible, a glove and a mask. You are in effect a caregiver um, of that uh, patient who is your family member. And so you want to limit uh, the spread of that virus to you as the caregiver much the same way a doctor or a nurse or a respiratory therapist would if they were caring for somebody in a hospital. Right. And so if, you're, if your family member doesn't need a hospital and can be cared for at home, you're going to be the one that needs to do the protective measures to limit spread within your own home. Thank you so much, and thank you for joining us. We'll see you tomorrow.